go ahead and keep coming on coming on in while you're coming in. Uh, I want to welcome you to the Tenasket Free Methodist Church. I'm glad you're here. It's always good to spend this Sunday with church family. Amen. 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 Well, you know, here we, we worship God. We love people. That means you. And uh, we value discipleship. And one of the things you'll see um, as times go by, I said a couple Sundays ago that, uh, you know, just because our pastoral transition is kind of in this limbo state, that doesn't mean we as the body are. So something Ron and, and I have been working on is what that discipleship looks like. So you'll hear more about that over the next couple Sundays and uh, throughout the, the next month. But one thing that I'm excited to remind you of is, is VBS. Uh, we, have, we have already a great turnout. The registration opened, I believe, five days ago. And we're at 31 kids. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I, I said, I was telling Steph, five days we're at 31 kids. We still have about 20 left. I'm getting a little nervous. But that's a good problem to have. So we're really excited about that. There's lots of ways to still serve. We had a lot of people step up and are very excited to serve with the main purpose that we get to bring the gospel to kids who may not know about it. That's the main purpose. So one thing I want to challenge you guys with, you guys with, uh, guy being an intentional word to use, uh, when I looked around the room, I saw a whole bunch of women, godly women that want to serve, but I was the only guy in there. And I felt outnumbered. But I know guys have jobs and things to do. I know that, uh, I know, here's, here's a, a true statement. Godly boys need godly men. Godly boys need godly men. So um, I would just like you to be praying. If you know someone or if you are interested in serving in some way uh, with VBS, I know the first thing guys think of is, I don't dance. And I know there's lots of dance moves with VBS. Don't worry, you don't have to. There's other things you can do. Um, we have things like dig sites and stuff like that. This is kind of an archaeology theme. So I would just have you be praying about if, if you want to serve or if you feel like God's calling you to serve in VBS, we would love to have you. So just be thinking about that. Well, on that note, I have one more video for us that will kind of uh, let you under, it'll help you understand what this VBS is about. So just, just watch this. looks fun, right? Yeah. Well, I want you to just be praying about, uh, uh, that's not, that invitation wasn't just to the guys, women, if you still feel called to come, we would love to have you. So uh, just be praying about if you, if you are, uh, would like to serve. And also, it's a great time. Like I said before, it's a great time. If you have a neighbor who doesn't know anything about Jesus and they have kids, they can come. Here's the really cool thing about this VBS. We have volunteers for the nursery. That means infant all the way through adult. We have an adult class so that when parents come and drop them off, they can sit with uh, someone who's gonna run a chosen series and they can sit and watch and learn about Jesus themselves. So it's, a, it's gonna be an awesome VBS and we just wanna invite you uh, to give you the, the invitation to invite others. There's lots of stuff in the back that 
uh, Lana has been handing out, and if you just want materials to hand out to people, we have that for you as well. So let me pray for our time together. Uh, let me remind you the, the way we've been giving now. There's a box in the back, a wooden box in the back. It has prayer requests and connect with us cards, and there's a little slot to put your tithe in. Uh, it's back there. We don't pass a plate anymore. And uh, let me pray for our time together and pray for, for our, our giving. Lord Jesus, I am. Uh, I'm always amazed by you. I'm always amazed at how you work, and you you tend to go almost every time above and beyond what uh, what I what I expect. God, and I see you working that way in our body, um, not just with BBS, but BBS is a good example. Father, we continue to pray for uh, today. Father, as we come together, uh, a family of God. We, we come uh, anticipating to hear from you. As Pastor Ron speaks and presents a message that you've given him from your word, uh, Father, I pray that we would, just like I prayed last Sunday, we would uh, ignore the distractions, Father, and focus on you and your word. We pray you would bless Ron as he, as he delivers the message, uh, God, and may you give him the right words to say, even if uh, he didn't plan on saying them. God, and I pray for the ways that you've provided for us. God, in that, in that same uh, note, we, we give back. Uh, sometimes we hold on dearly to it, uh, Father, but I know that when we give um, out of an open hand, uh, God, you use it in amazing ways, uh, Father. And so we do pray that uh, the, the giving, the, the money that we give and the resources, the time and talent, Father, that you use it in amazing ways to expand your kingdom. God, there's many people who still do not know about you. Father, pray for the worship and our time together. We love you and pray these things in your name. Amen. We good? All right. Good morning, church. If you would join in worship with me, please, and stand. The focus today um, during this, the sermon, Pastor Ron is going to bring out scriptures to grow our understanding of the Holy Spirit. And so, the first two songs we're going to sing are, are, are prayers, and um, so please just pray with me in worship to our Lord. Mm -hmm. Oh, 
Ini di jari Father we ask even as we quiet ourselves as we try to settle in after we worship you we pray Lord that our worship this morning was glorifying to you Lord, that's our desire, Lord, to worship you in spirit and in truth and for you to be pleased with the offerings of our praises. And now, Lord, we, we confess our desperate need for you to minister to us. Uh, you are our life, and Lord, we so easily can stray our, our thoughts, even in prayer, can so quickly wander Lord, sometimes in our fatigue, we even drift off. And so, Lord, we pray that by your spirit and by your divine presence, Lord, you would uh, strengthen us and give us the grace, Lord, to, to be able to respond to you even in our prayers. Lord, we pray in, in humility, recognizing and acknowledging that we need you. We acknowledge, Lord, that you are all-powerful and you are all-knowing and when we pray we're not informing you of anything but we are being obedient because you've instructed us to pray you've told us in your word to pray without ceasing that we are to be a people of prayer and so Lord we pray and Lord there's so much that we could pray about Father but I I especially want to pray for our spiritual condition because in the, in, in the big picture, Lord, that's what you're concerned with. You love us enough and you have compassion on us enough that you care about our daily needs and you care about, Lord, our health and even mental well-being. But ultimately, Lord, you, you are concerned with our soul. You care about where we're at in our spiritual walk and our growth with you and so Lord, I pray that you would forgive us on areas that we have hindered that growth, where we have strayed from the path that you put us on, or those places that maybe we have grieved or, or quenched the very spirit of God that's within us. And so, Lord, as you forgive us, Lord, we pray and we give thanks for that grace. You truly are a holy God. And you want us to be a holy people. And we can't do that on our own. Lord, it's not that we're perfect, but uh, <clears throat> it is your desire that we be complete. Mature to the place where we're not tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine that we're, we don't get excited just about bandwagon Christianity, but with the, with the truth of who you are and who you are in us and your sovereign will for humanity. That someday, Lord, and maybe soon, you're gonna return. And in that return, there's gonna be a renewal and a restoration and we'll be caught up with you. And we're told in your word that we're to encourage one another with those words. That even in the darkest of days, God is with us and he is for us. And someday he's gonna take us out of this place and we are gonna be reunited with him forever. And he's going to establish a kingdom on earth. And Lord, we give thanks for that. We do want to be encouraged by that. But Lord, as we walk this life, there, there are sickness, Lord, there are injuries and the frailty of the human body. And Lord, I pray for those things. Lord, I pray for the Harriman family that are grieving the loss of Kim. And Lord, that's never easy. And I just pray, Father, that you would comfort all that's involved there. Lord, we uh, pray for Heather. I think she uh, broke her pelvis in a riding accident. And Tiffany, that's going to be facing surgery in a little while for some cancer and all that that might entail. Lord, these are people that we want to lift up to you. And Father, I pray for our church here in this transition. We continue to pray for the, the one that you have that you plan to come here. But as Mac has already said, oh Lord, we, 
we're not in a holding pattern in ministry or you still the call in our lives are the same um, to go and make disciples of all nations Lord. and so I pray for this DPS that it would be a time where young people come to Christ and as we see in the New Testament it would not just be young people but it would be households that would come to faith to you Lord and so Lord for discipleship and ministry and Christian education and and coming alongside one another and spurring one another on all these things that makes the body of Christ. We want to be about that. We want to be found doing our Father's business when he returns. Father, I pray for those that are in wall, that are discouraged in the days that we live in, Lord, that you would encourage them and bring them to a place of faith. And Lord, I pray for anyone here that if they come in doubt, Lord, I pray that they may leave this place full of faith, and if they're discouraged, that they would leave encouraged. And I pray, Lord, <clears throat> whatever we do, that would bring you glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, uh, this is nothing new, so welcome to perfect hey, I mean, this is the only time i heard a kid be the loudest one uh you know we're hearing something uh, from pastor ron today he's going to preach uh on the holy spirit and sometimes when i mean maybe you're like me when you hear that there's a lot of different things that pop in your head because the holy spirit offers a lot of things and there's this verse pastor ron's talking about where jesus is talking and he says uh it's actually better that i go because of what will come. And I don't know about you, but when I first heard that, I went, hold on. What would be better than Jesus walking side by side with us? Like, what could be better than that? And uh, I, have, I have a little illustration to help us understand that. So I need a kid for a volunteer. Ooh, I like it. All right. Come on up. It's, oh, and he is excited too. Come on over here. Okay. Can he light a candle? Is that okay? I'll watch. Okay. Are you comfortable lighting a candle? You don't know. You'll find out in a minute. Hey, tell everyone your name and how old you are. Tristan and five. Tristan and five. Okay. So here I have this cool looking candle that Pastor Ron said it looks like we're in the Holy of Holies. Okay, you want to help me? I'm going to pull this trigger and we're going to light this candle. Okay? <clears throat> Maybe. Okay, perfect. Thank you for the help. All right, now I have this balloon. Okay, now this balloon represents us, okay? Is he happy or sad? Yeah, yeah he's sad. So there's something in Scripture... Um, there's something in the Bible that says that the Holy Spirit has a lot of different roles, but one of them is a comforter. What do you think that means? Um, I think it means, um, I think it means that Jesus is real. You, oh, I love it. I love it. Yeah. And he gives the Holy Spirit, it's his spirit, and he makes you feel better in tough times. That's what that means, the comforter. Now, I don't know about you, but adults, can you relate to being held over the fire yeah. in life? There's times where we just don't feel very good. Now, I'm going to hold this balloon over the fire, okay? What do you think is going to happen? I think it's going to pop. Yeah. Do you think you want to pop and cover your ears, maybe? Or you just want to listen to it? I'm just giving you a warning. Okay. Let's see what happens as we hold it over the fire. What, what happened? I'm a regular You know what, Tristan, you're really smart. <laughs> now I have this balloon. Is he happy or sad? Happy. Say it again. Happy. 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 Now, I don't know... If you can see, is there something in there? Water. Oh, he is smart. What do you think is going to happen if I hold this over? It's going to splash water everywhere. Oh, you think it's going to splash water everywhere? Yeah. <laughs> Not going to lie, I practice this, but it still makes me a little nervous. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So pray for me while we're doing this, okay? Okay. Let's see what happens when this is held over the flame. Did it pop? Yeah. We even touched it. Did it pop? No. Why do you think that is? Um, I think, I don't know. <laughs> no. It's because there's water in there. Oh. oh. So the awesome thing about that is this water keeps it cool when it's on the flame. And the amazing thing about that is Jesus and John calls the Holy Spirit the living water. And when you're filled with the living water, even though uh, my favorite verse in the Bible says that when you believe in Jesus, life is super easy after that. <laughs> That's because that verse isn't in there. It's not super easy. I'm going to go ahead and set this down. Tristan, will you wave and they're going to clap for you and say thank you for, for helping us. <laughs> Great job, great job. Well, the reason the reason uh, it didn't pop is it had that water in it. And that's just like us, that when we believe in Jesus, we have the Holy Spirit. And when in life, when we're held over the flame, he comforts us through that. That's one of the many roles of the Holy Spirit. So, kids, when you're going through life, and I can promise you, if you haven't experienced it yet, you will. Life's not always easy. But remember that you have the Holy Spirit. And he'll comfort you through that. It, like I said, there's no verse in the Bible that says it's easy after that. But he promises not to leave you. So you're not going through those hard times alone. Okay. Would you guys pray with me? And then, kids, uh, we have nursery all the way up through uh, sixth grade. You can go upstairs with me. I'll be teaching the, the older group and Susan in nursery. Let's pray. Uh, God, I thank you for these hearts. And that uh, we get an opportunity to live out what it means to... To rely on the Holy Spirit. God, I pray that's what they see when they, when we're around them, when we're around these kids, that they see your spirit in action. Father, I pray they learn how to rely on the Holy Spirit at a very young age. Uh, rely on, 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 on you and not themselves. I can look at my own life and see where I've fallen short in those areas. God, I pray for Sunday school this morning that when we're up there focused on your word, they're hearing your truth, uh, not just some words I'm, I'm, I'm telling you. Father, and that when they're in nursery, they're feeling the love of those who, who rely on Christ, and that that's what they experience is your love through them. God, we thank you for this opportunity. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Uh, good morning, church. Um, I'm Pastor Ron, and I'm a little more than five. <laughs> I was I was trying to remember the first time I ever bought a wallet when I was in you know twelve or thirteen. I I would earn a little bit of money. We, my grandmother always said that we don't pay you for being part of the family. You have to contribute. So I never, I never got an allowance. Uh, but there, there was opportunities. They wanted to give opportunities for me to earn money. So they had different things that I could do. And I think they were trying to teach me to be, you know, use money properly. And I, I didn't learn that right then. Uh, because we go... It, Sometimes once a week, but at least every other week we would go to town and I would head for the Rexall Drugstore and buy comic books and, you know, all that kind of good stuff they have in Rexall Drugstore. But about, about 14, as I matured, <laughs> I decided I wanted, I, want, I knew I, I wanted to buy a gun. I know that's probably not politically correct right now, so you forgive me, you pray for me. Um, but I wanted to buy, I wanted to buy my own gun, and so uh, in Wenatchee, living in Wenatchee, the one opportunity you had to earn money uh, was picking cherries. And I'll never forget that, because it was five, I don't know why it was five cents a pound. That just stays in my mind. 
And so I picked cherries, and so I, I made a pretty good amount of money through the summer, and so then I didn't have anywhere to put my money. So I decided to get a billfold, you know. So I had a billfold. Now that I'm older, I put it in the front because sitting on it throws my back out, you know. <laughs> Only has $2 in it, it doesn't take much. <laughs> and so I, got, I, have, I have this billfold, and so I got to think about that. I've had this billfold or wallet, and I think most men have those. And more than likely, women have an equivalent stuck in their purse, hidden in the black abyss. They have it as well. And if you're like me, you've been carrying it a long time, it's been with you a long time, but you don't really give it any thought, right? I mean, I don't, sometimes I, I even forget to bring it. I, I show up and say, oh my gosh. I drove down here and don't even have my wallet. The only time I really think about, there's two times that I think about my billfold, and that's, that's when the cops are stopping me to ask for directions, or I have a lot of money in it. When we've traveled a few times, when I have a little extra money in my pocket, everybody's a pickpocket as far as I'm concerned. You know, so I'm, I, I even got one of those money bills. Real, real tricky, you know, to put my money in. Don't give it any thought whatsoever. And that's how it is for a lot of us with the Holy Spirit. Some of you have been in Christ for decades. Maybe accepted Christ as a young child. Maybe at DBS. Maybe that's been your own experience. And when you were brought in and in Christ, you received God's Holy Spirit to dwell within you. And maybe since then, you really haven't given it much consideration at all. And so what I'm hoping to do today is a couple of things. I want to try to bring a little clarity to some things that can be confusing. And secondly, I, I would love it if we would value the Holy Spirit in our lives. Because the thing that I've noticed about us as people, the things we value, we have a tendency to protect and to think about. We consider those. I could probably go to your, to your home and tell you what you valued because it may be dusted, polished, on the mantle, in the gun safe. Oh, there I go again, sorry. But whatever you value is pretty obvious for other people to see that. And we want to value the Holy Spirit in our lives. So Jesus says this. Now Jesus has been telling his disciples in several ways that he was going to be handed over to men, to violent men, and he was going to be crucified, and on the third day he, he would be raised from the dead. He's been telling them that, and along with that, as the time drew closer, he's, he's told them, not, not only am I going to die, it, it, time is coming that I'm going to leave you. Boys, I'm gone. I'm going to, I'm going to be gone. I'm going to return to my father. That's the language he talks about. That's what he uses. I'm returning to my father. He said it, but they didn't always understand it. But in John chapter 16, he says this. Nevertheless, I am telling you the truth. It is for your benefit. Now, some versions say it's to your advantage that I go away. Because if I don't go away, the counselor will not come to you. If I go, I will send him to you. So we have this great exchange Jesus is resurrected. He spends 40 days witnesses. You look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and you see all the things that were going on. He returns to his Father and he sends his Holy Spirit. And when he comes, he will convince, he convict the world about sin, righteousness and judgment, about sin because they do not believe in me, about righteousness because I'm going to the Father and you will no longer see me and about judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. Now, uh, teaching on the Holy Spirit is, is, is vast, so obviously I'm not going to be able to cover everything today, but I do want to just, like I said, try to answer a few questions that maybe arise. And in your notes, you'll see one of the questions I have is, why is there confusion about the Holy Spirit? Well. Even as I thought about that, that's kind of an unfair question because we probably have to take that case by case. 
For some of us, there's confusion about the Holy Spirit because you've never been taught about the Holy Spirit. There's been no education, no instruction. Or maybe it's been very limited. For others, it's maybe misinformation that what you've heard. Or you hear things and you're not even sure is, is that true or, or what is true about that. In Acts 1.5, Jesus says this, he says, for John, this is John the Baptist, baptized with water, but in a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now, I mean, think about this, these instructions, Matt talked about it a little bit, but think about that you were called to follow Jesus, and that's what we've been, been called as well. Those disciples, those apostles of his, left family, they left loved ones, they left their places of residence, they left whatever occupations, whatever whatever their the jobs were, and they followed Jesus for just about three years, walked with him, they, they were taught by him, they were in close proximity to him, they saw him do unbelievable, miraculous things. So for him to stand there and say, it is good that I go away because it's to your advantage, to your benefit. If Jesus says something like that, that must be true, amen? amen? So this must be something very important for us as believers and very significant for us to understand that the same spirit that dwelt in Christ, he is sent to dwell in us. So part of this confusion I mean, when you, when you think about it, I mean, it, the Holy Spirit is talked about in John chapter 4 when he's talking with Nicodemus. It's what? It's the Holy Spirit's like a wind that blows where it wants. And at Pentecost, it's like tongues of fire. So you hear this. It's, it's the illustration that Matt gave. It's, it's this living water. So somebody said that the Holy Spirit leaves no footprints in the sand. Some of us think of the Holy Spirit, maybe your own King James person, and so is the Holy Ghost. And so now you're thinking Ghostbusters and you're, you know, trying to get your trifecta meter or whatever it is so you can see if it's around and all the stuff that's in our culture today. So there, there's all this language and all these things, and so there's some confusion. And I think primarily it's confusion based on the language itself. Because you'll find that you'll have the baptism that I just read, you'll have indwelling, and feeling, and filling, rather, receiving, coming upon, falling upon, poured out, all, of, all that language is found in Scripture. And a lot of times we don't make any distinction in it. Or we already go at it, we think we already know what a particular term is. And so, I, I want to try to help help with that because I think this is one of the most important things. And I've said it before many times. The most important thing we can do when we go to Scripture and read Scripture is keep it in context. What is the context here? And so I want to give you a little context. I want, let me turn over here. When, when Jesus is talking about the fact he's going away, he, he is preparing them for the fact that a Pentecost is coming. He's sending his Holy Spirit. And so in Acts chapter 1, verse 4, he says this. He gathered them together. This is Jesus gathering his disciples together. And he commanded them, don't, don't leave Jerusalem. You wait there for the Father had promised. And the, when they said this, what you have heard from me, that John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit, not many days from now. So obviously that's talking about the promise of the Holy Spirit and Pentecost. Now down in verse 8 he says this, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Another description of the same event. You go to chapter 2 when the event actually happens, you have Jesus saying baptism, then a little later he talks about it coming upon you, the Holy Spirit. In chapter 2, 
he says, and when the day of Pentecost had come, this is Luke's writing now, they were all together in one place and suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind and they were fill, it filled the house with which were, in which they were sitting. And it appeared to them as tongues of fire distributed themselves as they rested on each one of them and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues and the Spirit was giving them utterances. So I have three different descriptions, three different words saying the same event. We have baptism, which is only used here. You never see any time in scripture where it says to be baptized again in the Holy Spirit. You have Jesus himself talking about the Holy Spirit coming upon you. And then you have Luke, as he describes the event actually took place, Pentecost as we know it, as a filling. So context is very important because you might have somebody says, well, have you, have you been filled by the Holy Spirit? Well, what do you mean by that? What's the context of it? Are you talking about me receiving the Holy Spirit? Yeah, yeah. I, I received the Holy Spirit. I received the Holy Spirit when I came into Christ. Now, there's some confusion also because we have the titles of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes it's the Holy Spirit. Sometimes it's the Holy Spirit of God. Sometimes it's the Spirit of Christ. You have different functions of the Holy Spirit. In Galatians, it talks about the Holy Spirit leading us, right? So there's these different functions. And then you have these different symbols that we've already talked about. We've got fire and water and, and wind and all these different things like that. And so that, if we don't understand that, that those different designations of the Holy Spirit, that can bring some confusion as well. So I want to look at what we hear most often. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit happens at our conversion. When we receive Christ, when, Christ, when we're really in Christ Jesus, then we receive the Holy Spirit. That's why in Romans 8, 9, I mean, it's very clear. It says, if you do not have the Spirit of Christ, you are not in Christ. I don't think that takes a theologian to understand what that's saying. The Holy Spirit comes in and dwells in us. Then you have the filling. Especially in this context. And like you see, filling can be in different places. So you, again, you have to look at the context. But the filling of the Holy Spirit is, is expected to be ongoing. You have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit always. He stays with you. But there is that we need this fresh filling, this ongoing filling. That's why it, talk, it talks about in Ephesians chapter 4, not to be drunk with wine, but what? Be filled. And if you read that, especially those of you who are good at English, it's in the present tense. Which means that we are continually, constantly to be refilled and filled with the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we are, are filled again with the Holy Spirit because God has a job or something he wants us to be prepared for. And he will do that. You see that that happens in people's lives. That's an infilling. It's this ongoing event in the present tense. And then... With that, we see that what we talk about, which all some people stress, is the, the empowering of the Holy Spirit. Because in Acts, what happens? They're empowered to witness. They're to go out and be his witnesses wherever they go. And that's exactly what happens. In Romans 15, it says the Holy Spirit will help us in our weakness. We're told the Holy Spirit helps us when we don't even know what to pray or how to pray. He'll do that. The Holy Spirit empowers us and encourages us as well. So there's all these things that the Holy Spirit does. And it's important for us to understand that the work of the Holy Spirit in our life is not, it's not for some elite Christian or some super Christian. It's for all Christians. That every single one of us, that if you're sitting here today or if you're online and you are in Christ, you have put your faith in Christ and Christ alone. 
to forgive you your sins, that he took the wrath of God on your behalf on the cross, and you received Jesus, then you have also re received the Holy Spirit. We need to understand that. And it, it changes your life. It does empower you. I, I think some of the most significant examples, maybe outside of your own, how, how you recognize that in your own life, but if you remember this story in the Gospels when Jesus is arrested, you know, Peter's in the court where you are trying to worm himself in the fire, and the little servant girl comes up and says, hey, aren't you one of those Galileans? No, I can tell. You got that, you got that accent. What did he say? Oh, yeah, I, I'm not ashamed of the Gospel. I love Jesus. No, he denied it. And he didn't deny it just once. He kept denying it and even, even cursed. Now, uh, fast forward a few days. And Pentecost happens some 40 days later. And here's the shy guy, the guy that didn't want to confess and admit that he's a, he follows Christ. He's out preaching, proclaiming the gospel. Not only, if you read it, his first Here's his first message. Man, he lays it into him. The, the, the one you crucified. He lays it out. And the gospel not only changed his life, but what happens to the crowd. The Holy Spirit moves there. And thousands are added daily by the proclamation of the gospel. That's all from the Holy Spirit. Now you can go a little bit further. You can go to Acts chapter 12. I love this. Especially if you're familiar with, with Peter, because... I kind of relate to Peter because he talks first and thinks second. <laughs> he just kind of jumps, you know, instead of just thinking things through. He, he just seems like a normal dude to me, you know. He just, he's just out there in all his rawness and his humanness. If you go to, to Acts chapter 12, Herod has, it, it, I, it's interesting the way it puts it, because it says that Herod, Herod is, is arresting and rounding up Christians, and he in, intends to, to make life difficult for them. Right? I found that interesting, because when you read the next verse, and it says, and they arrested uh, James, the brother of John, and he was killed. He was put to death. I think that's intending a little harm, right? So Peter's been arrested. Peter is in jail. They are intending probably to execute him the next day because Herod's idea was this, that the Jews, it was good with the Jews that they had killed James. So he thought, well, I'm not, you know, I'm going to get all I can out of this. So now I'm going to take Peter out, and I'm sure it's going to be the same way. So Peter's in jail. They've got guards at the doors, and he is between two soldiers and guess what he's doing he's not fretting he's not pacing he's not praying he's sleeping you don't sleep when you're facing death if you don't have the holy spirit and the power of the holy spirit and the confidence of what jesus christ has taught us in your heart he empowers us so who's the Holy Spirit? I need to get going. Well, obviously, part of the Trinity, and most of the time we think we don't see the Trinity, but the Trinity is in several places. You see it in the baptism of Christ. You see it in Genesis. Um, in the Great Commission, especially, go and baptize in the name of what? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But in 2 Corinthians, it says this, May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. The Holy Spirit is a person. Now, why do I even bring that up? Uh, it's important for us to understand that the Holy Spirit is a person. He's co-equal. Very, very much as much as God is God and Jesus Christ. They are equal. They're one, three in one. And that's a whole other teaching. Uh, and I, that I'm not going to get into. But it's important that we realize the Holy Spirit is part of the Godhead and he is a person. Why do I say that? Because 
sometimes I've heard people talk about the Holy Spirit being kind of like a force, like, you know, they watch too much Star Wars, and so be, may the force be with you. You know, it's just kind of, Holy Spirit comes in and it just, you know, helps you that way. Or sometimes they say when they say it. Or sometimes, as I mentioned earlier, you're thinking more in a spirit, spirit, ghostly, vapory kind of stuff. Surreal, like that, and they just don't understand it. But he's a person. If you look in scripture, you'll see that it, it, the Holy Spirit thinks. The Holy Spirit has a will. The Holy Spirit can be grieved. We see in Acts chapter 5 that church, church didn't get very far past Pentecost in Acts chapter 5, and it says the Holy Spirit can be lied to. That's Ananias and Sapphira. Can be blasphemed, insulted, quenched, and grieved. There's all these things that the Holy Spirit as a person can do. And the Holy Spirit didn't just show up at Pentecost. The Holy Spirit has been active from creation. So look at the second verse in Genesis. The Holy Spirit is brooding over the waters. We see it coming upon Samson and different ones in the Old Testament. See it in the New Testament in the baptism of Jesus. The Holy Spirit's been active from the beginning because he's co-equal with God. So why should we value the Holy Spirit? I mean, I think everything I said, but for a lot of reasons. In John 14, 6, he says this, I'll ask the Father, and he'll give you a, another, an advocate, in, in this version, that will be with you forever. The Holy Spirit is with you forever. And the advantage of the Holy Spirit, one of the most obvious advantages of the Holy Spirit, that even after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, when he appeared, he appeared to the disciples, and then to Peter, and then to, to others, 500 other witnesses. When he was over here with Peter, the other disciples didn't see him. He was limited to his body and the physical space. Now in the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit can be in each one of us, in all the believers in Christ around the world, amen? And be working the ministry that the Holy Spirit does in all of us virtually at the same time. He is in us. And, I mean, I can't say it enough to, uh, because I don't think that we really, I'm not sure we even believe it, that the same Holy Spirit that allowed when Jesus was baptized and the Spirit like a dove came down to fill Him, that same Spirit that indwelt Jesus indwells you. You, you didn't get a second-hand one. You didn't get a partial one. You know, you didn't get a knockoff from China. You got the Holy Spirit, the breath of God from heaven to you. And we should rejoice in that and live in that. Salvation and spiritual success is impossible without it. You just would not be anywhere. The Holy Spirit indwells and empowers it. You know, in 1 Corinthians, it, says, it reminds us that our, our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, that he dwells in us. He gives us his power when he comes upon us. The Holy Spirit, <clears throat> it's not, not a common term, but he quickens, you know. What that means is it kind of makes us alive, that, that regeneration, that we could go, maybe a good example would be, I think it's in uh, Acts chapter 9. Remember that Saul at that time was, was persecuting Christians. He was there when Stephen was put to death. He's on the road to Damascus. You know, Jesus comes and says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he says, who are you, Lord? Remember he is blinded? Remember the story? Go to chapter 9. And he is prayed for that he would be able to see and receive the Holy Spirit and his eyes were open. Now, right there, we more than likely have conversion and the indwelling at that time, same thing. But it was, it was that coming of the Holy Spirit that removed the scales from his eyes, uh, allowed him to see. Remember when I talked about 
the twilight zone last week, the people are dark in darkness. And you have several scriptures that says that we've been taken out of darkness into his marvelous light, that we're not people of light. And in Ephesians says that we are darkened even in our understanding, our, our minds, our intellect, how we perceive the things of God. We just didn't get it. Just didn't just didn't make any sense to us. It's the Holy Spirit that makes that clear to us. It's it's that Holy Spirit that does that. And and that's very, very important. It says when he draws us that we'll be convicted and convinced of our sin. And why is that important? Because you know, I, I don't know if you remember your life before Christ, but I didn't sin before. I just made mistakes. <laughs> That's all. It was just an inconvenience. It was be, because of the family I was raised with. It was the neighbor's dog. It, I didn't do it. It's the Holy Spirit that comes in and makes it say, well, wait a minute, it is you. You are the problem. <laughs> we wouldn't have that without. And without that, without that, see, here's what the world does. The world shames us. And so we hide the things and our mistakes. Or we rationalize them like I did. And the devil condemns us. And so neither one of those draws us to God and to the cross and to grace, but the Holy Spirit does. And you might have thought you stumbled onto it or you just had an epiphany. And you know what I need in my life? I need Jesus. No. That was God's Holy Spirit working in your life because we absolutely have no ability to change ourselves. We try it. I mean, even, even after you're in Christ, anybody made a resolution? Quit. I know. We're not very good at change on our own. But the Holy Spirit changes us from the inside. So when it draws men and women to himself, he's our helper. And I don't have time to go into all that, but just let me quickly say this. When you, when you look at the version that talks about being an advocate, that's somebody that's going to stand up for you almost in a legal sense. The enemy, the accuser of the brethren, is, is condemns us. He accuses us before the Holy One of God. He, he, he goes before the throne of grace and accuses us. And it's like this in that courtroom. Jesus stands up and said, it's been paid for covered. It's done. He's our helper. He's the one that comes alongside us. As a matter of fact, that's really the language when it talks about in the, in the language, the literal, literal language is a, a paraclete, but it's the one that comes alongside. And we can think about that when we, we're having troubles and somebody comes alongside us. Somebody helps us. That's what tells us in Galatians that come alongside one another and so fulfill the law of Christ. That's what it's talking about. The Holy Spirit does that in our lives and he comforts us he's our counselor the holy spirit reminds us of all things and teaches us everything that christ commanded us think of that and when you look at the descriptions the old testament talks about the holy spirit being eternal talks about the holy spirit being good talks about being free like wind and fire think about that fire purifies all these things, they have significant to us. And so it's very, very important. And then the Holy Spirit gives gifts, obviously. You go, I mean, go to Romans, you go to Ephesians, but especially 1 Corinthians chapter 12. The whole chapter talks about the gifts of the Holy Spirit again. It's another whole other teaching that we could go on. Maybe we need to do a Sunday school class on the, the Holy Spirit so we can understand that. But he not only gifts us, so that we can accomplish the purposes that God has for us and for his body and for, for the church universal. But he gives us what? He, we have the fruit of the Spirit. So we have this fruit, which is, which is the Holy Spirit indwelling in us and leading us in such a way that we bear fruit of love and joy and peace and patience and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness and long-suffering. I mean, just think about that. And as you're thinking about that, if those things aren't manifested in you and you're in Christ, maybe you're grieving the Holy Spirit. 
The Holy Spirit is our all in all. He empowers us. He, you might say, propels us or motivates us to serve Him and bring God glory. And so, I really hope that just like I pat my wallet once in a while when I'm in the crowd of the pit pockets, you think about when you're going through something difficult or you wonder what God is doing right now in our world, you just pat that and remember that you were filled with the very spirit of Christ. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for that gift. Lord, I think of what Peter says in 2 Peter when he says that your divine presence, that Holy Spirit, that divine presence that makes it possible for us to live good and godly lives. And Lord, I thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for loaning that to me. join me. This song um, is once again just coming before the Lord with, with open hands and it's called I Surrender and I know that throughout my life as I have acknowledged the, the work of God in my life and the work he desires to do it's a real humbling to know I need to surrender to the Holy Spirit and be still before him and his soft voice and so he can give me an understanding of his scriptures and so I just would ask you to to join me in that surrender of worship also I failed to make um, an offering of the altar if you want to come and pray um, during this song um, our pastors and other people would love to come pray with you and um, it just goes along with the I surrender. Sometimes we just need to lay it all at the altar and really allow the Holy Spirit to minister to us. So, I surrender. <laughs>
that don't want hearts, so we just surrender in a way that actively receives the things you want us to receive. Father, we need your help in our homes, in our relationships, in the ministries that you've put before us. We need your correction and your conviction and your hope, your peace, your joy. Jesus, you are so faithful to us. Thank you for the Holy Spirit that you've given to those of us who have received, those of us who have put our faith and surrender to you, Jesus. Please go before us this day and this week. Please help us to allow you to speak into our minds and hearts. In your precious name, Jesus, amen. amen. God bless you. Thank <laughs> you.